Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Live at 585 on this Sunday morning. We are in Revelation chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2 again. Uh, we covered part of it yesterday, but I want to uh, spend the next couple days uh, getting up to speed on some of these things. So Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, just by way of reminder. John says, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, Revelation chapter 6 starts what we call the tribulation period. And um, <clears throat> there's a lot of misconceptions about the tribulation period. And uh, I just want to go through and find out here real quick this morning what the Bible has to say about a lot of this stuff. So Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 19 lays out for us the tribulation period. And one of the first uh, questions that people often ask is, how long is the tribulation period? And that's a good question. Is it three and a half years or is it seven years? Those are kind of the two big debates because over and over and over again throughout the book of Revelation, we see this idea of three and a half years mentioned. And uh, But some pre-tribulation Christians like myself often refer to it as being a seven-year-long tribulation period. And you say, well, how does all that work out? We get the, the, the seven years from Daniel chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And actually, I want to do that in this Bible because I have my notes in it. Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 and 27 is the key. Daniel 9 is one of the most um, exciting chapters in the Bible when it comes to prophecy. And Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 and 27 um, we have a great prophecy about the end times. Verses 24 through 27 is a great prophecy about the Messiah and Jesus, but I don't have time to get into verses 24 and 25 today, but that deals with the triumphal entry of Jesus as he rides into Jerusalem there on Palm Sunday, and we'll get into that some other time. But Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 says this, After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off and killed, but not for himself. Jesus, the Messiah, will be killed, but he's not dying for himself. Who's he dying for? For you and me. It says, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people of the prince who is to come. This title, the prince who is to come, is a title for the Antichrist. So the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city. Who destroyed the city in 70 AD? The Romans. So the Antichrist will have some sort of tie to Rome. It says, The end of it shall be with the flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then, he says in verse 27, uh, Then they shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Then he, the prince, the lawless one, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, will establish a covenant Remember in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, yesterday we talked about how the Antichrist is riding in on the back of that white horse, and what's in his hand? A bow. Not a bow and arrow. Something like a rainbow. Just like a rainbow is a sign of God's covenant with man, with Noah, this Antichrist comes onto the scene with a covenant. And this covenant that he makes is for one week. Now, we've already learned previously in verse 24 that a week is is not a group of seven days, but a week is a group of seven years. So he's going to make a seven-year covenant. He's going to make a covenant with many for one week, for seven years. But in the middle of the week, what's half of seven? 3.5. And this is where the book of Revelation gets this phrase of three and a half years or times, times, and a half a time. All of those are synony synonymous um 1,360 days, give or take. I'm forgetting the number right now, but that's referenced in Revelation as well. All of these are synonymous for half of the tribulation period, for the three and a half years. 
because it tells us here he's going to make a covenant for seven years this prince of peace but in the middle of the week of the seven years he's going to bring an end to sacrifice and offering and on the wings of an abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate in the middle of the seven years tribulation period seven year long what starts the tribulation period not the rapture of the church the rapture of the church can happen before the tribulation period ever starts it could happen one year before it could happen five years before it could happen one day before i think it's closer to the period than it is further away from it but the rapture of the church happens the church goes up then whatever period of time happens and the tribulation begins the tribulation begins with the ant antichrist this prince of peace making a covenant in the middle east a peace agreement with israel that starts god's clock for the seven year tribulation period halfway through three and a half years into that 42 months into this we see that the antichrist is going to break that peace agreement and he's going to do what the bible calls the abomination of desolation and many believe and i believe this is the case as well that what's happening here is during the seven years the antichrist allows for the temple to be rebuilt there in jerusalem and the jewish people are going to be convinced that the antichrist is the messiah because he's going to establish peace He's going to rebuild the temple. They're going to be all excited. The Jewish people are enamorated with this Prince of Peace, this Antichrist. But three and a half years into it, halfway through this thing, he's going to reveal his true colors that he's actually not a friend of Israel's, but an enemy to Israel's. And he's going to set up the abomination of desolation, something like um, which happened in, in history. He's going to sacrifice a pig on the altar, which would be an abomination to the Jewish people, and or he's going to set himself up in that temple as God and command everyone to bow down and worship him. And it's at that moment when the Jewish people, the scales will be pulled from their eyes, the blinders will be off, and they'll realize this guy is not who we thought he was. He's not what we he, he he's not all he's cracked up to be by any means. And their eyes will be open, but it'll be too late. He's already got the power. And then for the remainder three and a half years, it's going to be really, really, really difficult for the Jewish people particularly. So my point from taking you here to Daniel chapter 9, the question, how long is the tribulation period? It's seven years. So from Revelation chapter 6 to the start of Revelation chapter 19, we're dealing with a seven-year period of time, starting with the first seal, the Antichrist making a peace agreement with many, with the Middle East. So that's what we understand for how um, long the tribulation period is. Now, the other question that we need to answer here is, why does the tribulation period need to happen? Or what's happening during this time of the tribulation? And actually, back in Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 17, we understand a little bit more about this. We'll get to this studying it in a couple of days. But let's look at it here real quick. Revelation chapter 6, 15 through 17 it says, And the kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men, the commanders of the mighty men, and every slave and every free man hid themselves in caves and in rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, God the Father, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Why? Verse 17, For the great day of his wrath has come, who is able to stand? The tribulation period starts in chapter 6. As we get to the end of chapter 6, we see that it's brutal. And men, kings, rulers, slave and free, everyone on the face of the earth is hiding. And they're proclaiming, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. The reason why the tribulation period takes place is it's God's wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. Now, this is important because there's some Christians that believe that we have already started the tribulation period, that we're living in the tribulation period, and I would say not, not by any means. Not at all, buddy. We are not in the tribulation period yet. When the tribulation period happens, it's going to be rough. There's some Christians that think that they're going through the tribulation period and they have to have these bunkers and, and store up on ammo and food so that if their neighbor comes to and they're hungry, they can shoot them in Jesus' name because that's the Christian thing to do. 
right? That's not it at all either. Read the passage here in Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. You're not, your bunker's not going to hide you from the wrath of the Lamb. These guys are hiding in caves and they're crying out, have rocks fall on us because the great day of his wrath is coming. Who is able to hide against it? This is serious stuff, but here's the deal. My point is, is that there's nowhere to escape the wrath of the Lamb here on this earth. The only way to escape the wrath of the Lamb is to not be on this earth. It's to be taken up. Just like John was in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And Revelation 4 and 5 comes before Revelation chapter 6. And we see that there in heaven, there's the 24 other elders that are proclaiming the fact that they're seated on thrones, that they're clothed in white, and that they're given crowns. Just like all those promises are given to the church. My point is, is that the church is taken out. And the only way, the only way to escape the tribulation period is not to be on this earth. It's to be in heaven, and Jesus is going to call us up. And here's one of the ways that I know this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 gives us this. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, another key section of Scripture that deals with prophecy. And again, we're in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 for our um, study through Revelation. But we realize that Revelation chapter 6 starts the time of the tribulation. So to be sure we understand how all this unfolds, we're finding other scriptures and other references to help uh, connect the, the pieces of the puzzle. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 1, Paul says this. And I want you to notice here, he's talking about two different groups of people. And I'm going to emphasize this so that hopefully we can understand it. Paul says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you, he's writing to the church in Thessalonica, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that that day shall overcome you as a thief. You are all sons of light and of the day. And we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep in the night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as the helmet of hope and salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we walk, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. There's two groups of people in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You and us, they and them. The you and us, Paul puts himself in this category, believers, the church. The they and them are everyone else. And notice that distinction that he makes. And he says about they and them that they are not going to escape this time of tribulation, verse 3. But he says about you and us, he says in verse 9, God has not appointed us to wrath. They are not going to escape, the unbelievers. We, though, will escape. Why? Because God has not appointed us to wrath. We're going to be taken up, and we'll get more into that tomorrow. This is going to be at least a three or four part study here in Revelation chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 to connect this all together. I hope you're tracking with me. This is a lot for a Sunday morning, but it's important. The tribulation period is seven years long. It starts with the Antichrist covenant with the false peace agreement there in the Middle East. It's seven years long. Three and a half years into it, halfway through it, he's going to show his true colors and the Jewish people are going to realize they've been duped. The reason why the tribulation period has to happen is because it's God's wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. It's God's wrath being poured out. They, those who are not believers, will not be able to escape 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But we, us who are believers, are not appointed to wrath, but we're appointed to salvation. We get taken out. We'll get to that. Okay, so what's taking place here? Daniel chapter 12. This is the last place we'll go this morning. 
Daniel chapter 12 unlocks a little bit more for us in understanding this. Daniel chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 tells us this. At that time, Michael, and this is Michael the archangel who you've heard about in a few places in the Bible. At that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Michael the archangel is an angel that guards Israel. This verse just tells us this. At that time, Michael shall stand up. Who is Michael? That great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. God's people are Israel. So Michael the archangel is an, an archangel who guards Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people, Israel, shall be delivered, even one who is found written, everyone who's found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, and some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. There's going to be a time of trouble. Jeremiah refers it this way, a time of Jacob's trouble, or Israel's trouble. When Michael the archangel is going to step up, He's going to stand up. He's been protecting Israel all this time, but he's going to step up. He's going to step aside for a while. And there's going to be a time such as never been since Israel was a nation. Worse than the Holocaust? Worse than the Holocaust. This is going to be a brutal time. But God's shaking. God's waking up a nation. And he's shaking unbelievers as his last call. As he says, I'm getting ready to wrap this thing up. As you know it, this thing called life. And we're moving into a new dispensation. And though he's doing his last call, the church gets taken out. He's going to wake up a nation, Israel. He's going to shake up a world of unbelievers and give them one last opportunity to get right or to, um, to uh, go through really hard times. And through these hard times, he's going to be trying to get their attention. So my point is Daniel chapter 12 tells us that it's going to be a time like history has never seen for God's people, for the Jewish people. Then Jeremiah calls it a time of Jacob's trouble. So back to Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. The first seal is broken in heaven. Jesus the Lamb has the scroll in his hand. He breaks the first seal. When the first seal breaks, a rider on a white horse comes out. That rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. He comes with a bow in his hand, a covenant, a peace agreement for seven years with many. In the middle of those seven years, though, he's going to break that peace agreement. He's going out to try to conquer and to conquer. He's manipulative, and uh, we'll get more into um, why and how he's able to be revealed tomorrow. So let's pause there, but just realize this. Tribulation period, it's going to happen. It's prophesied in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's seven years long. Halfway through the tribulation period, though, things change drastically. And that's why throughout the book of Revelation, we see this phrase uh, three and a half years or times, times and a half at times or a 42 months reference because it's talking about that middle point when things change way worse. The whole thing is God's wrath starting in chapter six onward, but things get really worse halfway through, no doubt. The good news, you and I are not appointed to wrath. First Thessalonians chapter five, we're appointed to salvation. We don't have to experience an ounce of God's wrath in this life or in the life to come because Jesus took our place. And Jesus took our place. And because Jesus took our place to take the wrath of God, Jesus is going to take us out of here before God's wrath is poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. It really makes a lot of sense when you just think about it in those terms. Jesus took my place. Jesus took the wrath of God for me. Because Jesus took my place, Jesus has taken me out of this place before his wrath comes to this place. Simple stuff. That's something we have to look forward to. We'll look um, how that'll look a little bit more tomorrow in the moment. In the twinkling of an eye, we'll be taken up. And right now, the church is restraining the Antichrist from coming onto the scene. And we'll get to those verses tomorrow. But today, today, let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for today. And Jesus, we thank you that your word is true and that it's just uh, full of detail, especially when it comes to this time in the future, Lord, known as the tribulation period. And Jesus, thank you um, that we see that all this stuff is going to be unfolding. And Lord, we don't have to fear it. Lord, we see that there's going to be a seven-year peace agreement. We see that the Antichrist, this political figure, is going to be raised up on scene. And uh, Lord, he's not going to be all that he's cracked up to be. Um, but Lord, it's all part of your plan. 
But Jesus, we see that ultimately the reason for this seven-year tribulation period is for your wrath to be poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. It's to, to wake up a nation, the nation Israel. It's to shake up unbelievers as one last call to believe in you before this world as we know it comes to an end at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. So, Lord, even in this, we see your grace, we see your mercy as you're trying to get people's attention from it. But, Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you that your word is so clear that we as believers are not appointed to wrath but to salvation. And, Jesus, you took the wrath that we deserve so that when your wrath is poured out on this earth, Lord, we're taken away. Jesus, you took the wrath, and, Lord, you're going to take us. You're going to take us up there in Revelation chapter 4 as John was taken up. And you said to him, come up here. Lord, so too the time is coming when you're going to say to us as believers, come up here and we're going to be taken up in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. And Lord, we do look forward to that day. So I pray that as we continue to study these end time events and the catastrophes and the heartaches, Lord, that our heart would break for those who would be here. But Lord, that we wouldn't be afraid knowing that we're not going to be here. Jesus, you're taking us out. It's a promise in your word. So thank you for that truth today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. A lot of information. I don't know how else to do it, but to just keep feeding you all these other cross-references to connect the dots. And then when you go back through and join us each day, it'll all make more and more sense. If you miss a day, you need to get caught up because it's all going to tie together uh, rather concisely moving forward to be sure we're, we're understanding it. For the most part, the book of Revelation, it's chronological. It just goes out through. How the book of Revelation is written is how the book is going to unfold and uh, we'll get into more of that maybe tomorrow or the next day as well describing that for you but just understand this stuff's going to happen it's nothing we need to be freaked out about it's a promise from god's word i would argue actually it's rather exciting and it's fun to study but don't forget as we study about the tribulation and and the antichrist and all this stuff don't lose sight we are not looking for antichrist we're looking for jesus christ and that's where our eyes need to be so hopefully we'll see us this uh today um, for church at 9 or 11, we are looking at Matthew chapter 19 today. Some really good stuff in there as God, uh, Jesus is questioned about divorce and he deals with what is the family, what is marriage. That's a question that's kind of challenged a lot in our society today. What is marriage? Who gets to define mar marriage? Jesus talks more about little kids. We see the rich young ruler, a lot of cool stuff. So if you can't join us here live and in person in Salmon, uh, join us here on Facebook Live at 9 a.m. as we live stream, or you can catch it in the archives sometime later on, um, or you can come at 11, and we have Sunday School at 11 for the little ones. So hope to see you sometime today, and uh, have a blessed day.